me a little bit about your experiences um, working as a hobo. One well, of the most interesting thing about how I got the job, 1933, right in the midst of the Depression, the dean, uh, Kip McMurray, called me into his office, and he pronounced my name correctly. He said, Belly, I got a job for you. Well, that was something to be called into the dean's office at Bold Hall and told that um, he had a job. So. I, I, I was very proud of uh, being called in, particularly by the dean. I said, what is it? And he said, it's being a bum. Well, that took me back a little, but when he told me it was, uh, I think, three, $400 a month, then I, my, my spirits were lifted because you weren't getting more than three or $400 a month for a, a retired lawyer or a lawyer for even old Holy Gray Insurance Company in those days. So what it was was to go out and ride the rails and report back to some of the alphabetical agencies of uh, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Roosevelt and say what the people in the United States were thinking of at that time, the people being the, the, the bums and the, the, the hobos. So that's what I did. I rode the rails for about three months. Instead of studying for the bar examination, I took my bar examination. I damn near flunked it because I hadn't studied for it. But I, I, in no uncertain terms, told uh, the people that were in Washington, if they didn't know and they never got uh, their clothes soiled by going out and riding the rails, that the people of America weren't thinking of a revolution. They weren't thinking of overthrowing the government as bad as it was at that time or as the present time or has been in the past. They were the most patriotic of all Americans, even though they didn't have a job, even though they had to put the town on the stem, which means begging going in after and asking for a, a butt of yesterday's bread or a piece of old meat or something like that, which we did. I, I went into uh, the, the stores and, and uh, uh, got these scraps of food, and we brought them back, and then we put them in a big pot under the bridges, and I ate with all of uh, the other bombs. Uh, I mean, were you surprised by... Okay. Were you surprised by what you saw? Did you have different expectations about life on the road? A little bit. I'd, I'd seen uh, the movies, of course, and some of the, the categorized uh, picture of hobos or of bums. These were ordinary people. These were people who had nothing wrong with them except that they couldn't work because there was no jobs out there and they wanted to work. As a matter of fact, I was put in jail for vagrancy, which was a crime in those days. And I remember the judge calling me up and saying, uh, I'm going to find you guilty of vagrancy. And I said, vagrancy, what have I done? He says, uh, you don't have any visible means of support. And I said, I want to work. I mean, I was playing out the role of uh, the hobo. I want to go to work, but I can't get a job. He says, well, you're a vagrant. If you don't have any money, I'm going to give you six months. And so I said, I want a jury trial. It's down in San Diego. They picked me up off the street as I came into town. I, I told the judge I wanted a jury trial, and he said uh, to his uh, clerk, give Slim Bacigalupi here a jury trial. What's the first date we can give him? This was, uh, oh, this was about uh, right after the first of the year, and they said, oh, we got a date uh, in uh, December. Well, they were going to keep me in jail without bail because I had no money until December, so I finally pleaded guilty to vagrancy. Of course, I pleaded guilty to a crime that was wiped off the book because it was held to be unconstitutional. There's no such thing as vagrancy, status crime. The fact that uh, you don't have a job, you can't get a job, uh, there's no money, you can't be guilty of uh, something as uh, nebulous as that. And how we went for so many years with the crime of vagrancy on the books. And I know a lot of people, uh, bums, if you will, or hobos, were convicted of vagrancy and thrown into jail. Well. I got finally, when I pleaded guilty to vagrancy, the non-existent crime, rather than wait until December to go to trial, I got uh, some six months uh, probation or, or uh, suspended. I went back uh, two years later and I got the largest award that had ever been given in San Diego for a hobo who had lost his leg in the, the railroad uh, yard. I didn't tell the judge at that time that uh, I had a suspended sentence, but uh, I told him after the case was over with, and he was utterly and completely amazed. No, from that, I went to um, another job where I had almost the same 
type of people, people without money, the poor, the, the uh, underclass. I became the lawyer for the priest, Father George Amaro at San Quentin. And I made about as much, no, I didn't make as much money. I got a bottle of VAT 69 for every case that I defended. Well, they were all capital cases because we didn't have, in those days, an, an appellate justice, uh, a, a appellate lawyer who, who would um, uh, represent all of these people. Uh, for the purposes of the film, we need to stay back on, on the hobos, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, can, many people um, used to, the, the, the idea that hobos or transients would come into a community or would be coming into California was often used as a scare tactic um, to people. Do you think people were afraid of, of the hobos or what was your experience? No, I don't think so. I think that there were a lot of hobos that went up to doors in neighborhoods, knocked on the door, and got a hand down. And I think um, more of our people were compassionate than uncompassionate, and they took care of the hobos. Maybe some of the hobos uh, uh, burglarized, but there, there was burglary done by people who weren't hobos, who were professional uh, burglars. I, I think that these were very patriotic, good American people, and I wrote in my report that uh, these weren't people that were going to overthrow the government. They're very patriotic. I remember when I heard uh, uh, President Roosevelt say, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. I was under a bridge, uh, under a railroad bridge, and we were all sitting around there. We'd put all of the stuff that we had bagged in town in a big pot and cooked and we were having our evening meal and we heard this wonderful voice come aboard there. And so in Congress and out of place, this, this Harvard uh, Bostonian accent, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And these people nodded their head and they were the most patriotic people in America. And here I felt a little giddy, guilty. I was put out on the road to uh, scrutinize these people and report back to Washington. These people are going to overthrow the government. I said in no uncertain terms, these are the most patriotic Americans you've got. They believe in our country, and there should be no, uh, no crime of vagrancy. These guys want a job. From their point of view, from the hobo's point of view, um, what did, uh, had Roosevelt's New Deal not done enough? Um, oh, okay. Um, can you, I mean, did they feel that the, that Roosevelt and the New Deal was, was failing them? No, they felt that he was trying. I'm sorry, excuse me, when you asked if you could say, instead of they, if you could say the hobos or the... The hobos all felt that uh, he was trying. Uh, they felt that they had a friend in the White House, very much of a friend. But um, they, they felt that uh, it was just something that, that couldn't be helped. Uh, and I know there were rumors going around that... Um, uh, Herbert Hoover had been captured, captured, I remember the word, and was being held prisoner in uh, one of the big uh, office buildings in uh, New York. Wild things like that. It was a thing of the times that, uh, well, it was like a depression that was cyclic, that you couldn't help it. But uh, these were a patriotic American people. I think they were just as much patriotic as the people in Wall Street at that time. The people in Wall Street were all selling apples. I can remember down here in San Francisco that uh, stockbrokers were selling apples uh, on the street and other parts of uh, the United States at that time. Were you worried at all about your future in 1934? No, I wasn't. I was damn mad about it, and I, I resolved to do something about it, but that took the resolve of, uh, I guess, going into the part of the law that uh, I'm in at the present time. I've been on the side more of the have-nots than the haves. That doesn't mean that I can't like a bank president as much as a poor man, particularly if he's got some bad injuries and is going to go for a big award. But I think I've done more for the, the have-nots than I have for the haves. Melvin Bell, I take three up. We're changing to a new camera roll, uh, 314-31, and it's Melvin Bell. I um, take three up. Because he doesn't get it. Right. <laughs> um, okay, now I want to talk about 1934 when um, the governor's race, and I want to know that your experience um, with the governor's race. Well. 
there I got into the hypocrisy of politics because money poured into California from the east and all over the country. And again, I was hired uh, by the law school to go out and make speeches uh, for Miriam, who reminded me very much, did then, does now, of Guy Kibbe. And I think he was just about as fit for being a governor, uh, even though he paid me. I guess I made as much money from him going out and making those speeches I made in the first couple of years that I was practicing, but he didn't buy, buy my vote because I think he was pretty awful. I kind of liked the things that Upton Sinclair was saying, but we were instructed by the people who were sending us out that this fellow was going to send us into communism and everything else. And this is where I began to learn of the hypocrisy of, uh, I think, Wall Street, or better still, I think the hypocrisy of a lot of the haves against uh, the have-nots. Do you remember much about that campaign? You know, the um, what Upton Sinclair stood for, the kind of program that, that he Yeah, had. he stood for a division of uh, wealth. Uh, he stood uh, for a lot of socialistic uh, uh, activities. He stood for uh, Wall Street, and he stood for those uh, that have rather than for those who wanted. It was, it was fairly clear cut. It was one of those things you could feel more than you, you can uh, specify. You couldn't sit down a piece of paper except put on one side, he's voting for the haves, he's voting for the have-nots. Was it unusual at that time to be paid as a, as a, um, to give speeches for a candidate? They had so much money that uh, uh, they even got uh, kids in law school that uh, sorry, didn't want to go out and make sorry. speeches. Can you, can you phrase it by saying who they is? The Republicans had so much money? Well, they, they, it's a pretty amorphous. It seems everybody was in the campaign. The dean, uh, the politicians, uh, senators, businessmen, people in the brokerage houses. The they was, it seemed like uh, everybody. I mean, it seemed if you talked about uh, Sinclair, you kind of had to look around to see if uh, you were being watched. And uh, the whole campaign was being directed from the east. By the East, I mean the haves in uh, Wall Street, and the haves in uh, Washington, and the rumors uh, coming out that they had uh, Hoover, a prisoner in uh, one of the big buildings in uh, New York. That's uh, the only thing that came close to uh, what uh, the government was wondering about when they had sent us out on the road to see if there was going to be a revolution. And I saw that it uh, looked like people were concerned about the future of the country. Okay. Um do you remember anything that you said in any of the kind of speeches you gave, what, what you might have said in the speeches for Miriam? Well, I think I did a lot better when I got in before juries, and I was a lot more sincere, and it wasn't much longer, much after that, that I started trying cases. And when I tried cases representing Father Amara and I was representing condemned men over at San Quentin, I didn't have much better luck as to who to vote for. But um, at least I think I was more sincere. But do you remember at all what arguments you may have used or what kind of audiences you spoke to? Yes, I can remember very well. We would uh, go to uh, factories. We would get people when they came out of um, uh, uh, manufacturing plants. And uh, the bosses would drive them all out one gate, so here we young people would be there, and we would use this argument that uh, it's necessary to bring prosperity. It's just around the corner that uh, we do these things. You, you could see that the campaign was thoroughly directed by Wall Street, the haves, uh, 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 the government against uh, the, the people who were on the other side, being the other side. Uh, the, the socialists, uh, the, the people who were more idealistic. Did people ever ask you questions when you spoke? Did they ever? Not very much. I think that they were showing that uh, the boss, if he happened to be looking, that they had come out and they were at least listening to the argument. Was this on work time that, that people did this? Was it like, do you remember whether it was like get, uh, a speech that was given while people were at work that they were? Yeah, they together? would. They would. Uh, they would give us ten minutes where they would call them, the, the whistle would blow, and they'd cease working on the assembly line or wherever they were, and then we would give our 10-minute harangue, our 10-minute speech, which was a canned speech that would be given to us uh, by 
the fellas that uh, gave us the checks uh, in the law school or the people running the campaigns back east. It was more a national thing than a local thing because really uh, the people who were running the campaign were afraid that if Sinclair would get in in California, that would lead to a socialist uh, governor here, socialist governor back east, and here, here would come communism. That, that's what... Uh, that, that's what the bosses or whoever was directing was afraid of. It, it, it was a scary thing when I look back on it. And it was a scary thing that they got all of us bright-eyed, uh, supposedly intelligent kids to go for this. I think we were very hypocritical and very insincere. We were looking only for the money on the speeches that we made. I didn't believe a word I was saying. But, what, uh, but I, did, I did believe the opposite because they say again, I didn't vote for the bum guy, Kibbe, Merriam. I voted for the other guy. Um, did, um, uh, did you ever try to find out information about Sinclair? Did you ever go to any of his meetings or listen? No, no, I didn't. I, I wasn't particularly sold on, on the socialist concept at that time. Uh, I was more concerned about... Uh, um, getting a job and uh, practicing law. Because remember, he was running as a Democrat. That was one of the Yeah, uh, well, I was a Democrat and I'm a Democrat. Okay. Um, you were a Democrat then when you were giving speeches for Mary? Yeah, mm-hmm. Did they, they didn't care that you were a Democrat? They didn't care what I did, what I said, as long as uh, I had a clean white shirt on just out of law school and a bright-eyed young lawyer. This one is voting for uh, Mariam or Guy, uh, Guy Kibbe. And they didn't care uh, what political banner I was coming under. Okay. Uh, you said in, in your autobiography that um, uh, every, every speech you gave for Miriam meant votes for Sinclair. What do you, can you explain that at all? I don't remember saying that unless what I'm saying was that uh, my sincerity uh, leaked through. Because I know if, if I'd represent uh, a man now in a criminal case and would think that he is, is uh, downright uh, guilty, I think that would leak through. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the earliest cases that I had, I represented somebody that I thought was uh, wrong. It was a civil case. It was a doctor, and I thought he was wrong. And, um, and I, I felt that this showed through, and um, he lost his case. So I went to him after it and told him, I think that I was the reason you lost your case, that uh, I don't believe in you. And um, I took him on, on appeal. We reversed him. We got him a new trial. But I didn't try him the second time. I had someone else try him because I, I didn't believe him and I couldn't believe him. Now, maybe that's what I meant, that every vote that, uh, that uh, I urged uh, for Miriam was uh, a vote against him. Bella, I take four up. Wear your glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I put I put them on and off when yeah. I talk. Okay. If it's this question, you could keep them off. That would mm -hmm. be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, do you remember the news reels that were used? That, that they were considered to be not real news, fake news reels that were used against Sinclair about the hobos. Yeah, I think that the, I think the government was trying to whip up a fervor among the uh, bows, uh, among the have-nots. To, to uh, make it appear that there was a clear and present danger that the company would be overthrown by these bums. They were trying to show that we out there uh, weren't Americans, we weren't sincere, we weren't patriotic. I think the most pa patriotic people in America at that time were the people who were riding the rails. They believed in the country. They believed in this President Roosevelt when he talked about America, when he says we have only fear to fear. 
That was one time when I really saw, I think, the heart and soul and the spirit of America as I rode the rails. And it stayed with me ever since. It stayed with me when I went with uh, Father O'Mara, and I have it to the present time. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I take some of the cases that I do now. Okay, great. Good. I think that... Uh... Right, bye. 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 Next, I'm going to get room tone for the Belli interview. <laughs>